Hey, it's Laura. If you're listening to this, you're not hearing the complete unedited version of this conversation. If you want in on that, you can get it by becoming a TMST Plus member. Just head over to our website at tmstpod.com and click support. All right, enjoy the show. Hey, Laura here. This episode is super special to me because it's a conversation with one of my favorite humans, a dear friend in real life, and someone I actually see in the flesh on a regular basis. Jim Zartman is a certified Enneagram teacher, a former Midwest megachurch producer, a father, husband, and the co-founder of The Art of Growth, which is a top-rated Enneagram podcast and a company of the same name. Jim and I met back in 2017 through a Facebook group for people who are attending a Rob Bell event in Boston. I noticed from his posts that he lives one town over from me and was talking about the Enneagram, which I'd recently become obsessed with. Soon after, I met up with him and his wife for breakfast, and before we parted that day, I said something like, okay, so we are gonna be friends, right? To which he laughed and replied, yes, I think that's what's happening here. And (laughs) as you'll hear, Jim's been a huge part of my life since then. He's one of those friends who truly does want what's best for me and can often see what I'm growing into before I can. Jim's become an honorary member of my sobriety community, The Luckiest Club, as our resident Enneagram teacher. And when I invited him to present at our leadership retreat earlier this summer, he walked us through a new concept he'd been chewing on. We were all blown away, and I didn't stop thinking about it for weeks. So I brought him on the show to talk about it in more depth so you could hear it all too. I guess you could call it a relational energy framework. Uh, It describes the main types of energy we tend to bring into our interactions with other people. And as with all tendencies, they're usually unconscious and without knowing, they can get us stuck in some really painful patterns. But Jim introduces a fourth type of energy called with energy, and it provides a way to a much different place. Just naming these types of energy has already changed the way I show up in some of my relationships, especially ones where I feel like I want to fix something or someone, which is far more often than I'd like to admit. If you struggle with painful patterns in your own relationships, and let's be honest, who doesn't, this conversation is going to be super helpful and possibly a little cringy. But as Jim will tell you, shame has no purpose here. So rest in the energy of compassion and grace and possibility while you listen. If you want to talk about the episode after you listen, join our free community at tmstpod.com. All right, enjoy. So let's begin. Hi, my dear friend, Jim Zartman. Hi, my dear friend, Laura McCowan. <laughs> I was like, how does one begin on how, tell me something true? Just like that. It's fun to see you like this because we see each other. I just saw each other two days ago in real life. No, this is very different than when we were like hanging our feet over the back wall into the ocean uh, the other day. This is like so professional. I'm like, am I even am I uncomfortable? Okay, I got to get comfortable. Everything's fine. It's Laura. Everything's We're fine. fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start by having you take us through your career, your work path. And I know you're like me where it it's hard to get in in under five minutes because <laughs> there's so many <laughs> twists and turns and... I I want people to get a sense of who you are and how you arrived at this, where you are with work today. So start maybe with the the church days. Mm. 
I'll go back even further. I'll go back sure. to my very first job where I was landscaping for the cutest girl in the class, her family. And all day I listened to soundtracks and like listening was always my favorite thing. I just love auditory absorption. And then when I was 19 and I moved to Philadelphia and I worked as a janitor in a hotel and I listened to audiobooks like endlessly for a year. And it set me on this path of just being, oh my goodness, life is fascinating and I want to learn as much as I can. And because I grew up in the church world, I kind of consider myself a survivor of Christian fundamentalism in the West. And -hmm. it's a very specific thing. And that was the world I knew, so that's the world I gave myself to. And I was a musician. That's what I wanted to do. And so I had this decision when I was 17 that I'm going to sort of hit the peak of whatever that world is. And 10 years later, I was standing on stage in a 6,000-person church with the jumbotrons and the mics and leading the these large bands. And then I remember just starting to have more and more questions. And then I kept running into things that that just didn't make sense. And certain things started not making as much sense to me. In the church world? Um, yeah. And, and I was not coming into someone who's like, when I say that, I'm not saying someone as someone who is uninformed. But I sort of had these overlapping experiences where certain things were not squaring. Around the same time, we had like the 25 year anniversary of this church. And so we all gathered in one place at one time. And where so was this? this was in Xavier's uh, Xavier University Stadium in Cincinnati. And I remember walking out after playing and going, oh, is that it? It was a weird moment where I just felt let down. Because it was supposed to be this peak experience. and Yeah. Yeah. And for so many people around me, it was. And I think this is the thing that we are all trying to figure out. I don't think it's all about like having some you know, monumental, like I have to figure out my purpose and then I have to dedicate my life to it and then I have to monetize it. And I just think that whole thing is a trap. Mm -hmm. But like, am I applying my energies in the direction that best serves who I naturally am and where I naturally best serve the world? You started in like working in the church world around 17 and then this this peak experience happened around 27? I started leading actually and being on adult bands when I was like 15. Okay. Um, I, I was, was I was going to learn Yeah, I was going to learn to do sound and they heard me singing at the soundboard and asked me to join the adult band and then I was first hired in that full on capacity at 27 and Got I was it. there until my uh, mid 30s. But it was like yeah, my early 30s I had that experience and it was like this moment that I think a lot of us face where we're going, oh no, what does this mean? Like my life was like about, you know, having this family and all of a sudden my family is coming apart. My life was all about this career and it's not the right career. My life was all about this mission and I think I adopted someone else's mission. Yeah, you you invested <sighs> everything into it and it's you have this very terrifying moment of disillusion because oh. well shit, if it's not this then then what? And what does it's, that mean? What do I do now? <laughs> so what happened after that? When you what happened? Because you yeah, were married make, at that point, and yeah. So uh, my wife and I have been married for this this year, seventeen years. At least that part of my life has always been really good and really made sense. But to make a long story short, there was something about moving to Boston that my whole body settled. And I think I was too contentious for my environment in Ohio. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people don't pay enough attention to their bodies. And your body is the part when you're in someone's presence, like I'm comfortable in this person's presence. In this work, I feel solid in this work in my body. We don't even talk about that in 
culturally, it's societally, it was like, how does this feel to your body? You know, if right. you're not in yoga circles or you're not in, yeah. you know, certain circles where, where we acknowledge this, it's like, is this a logical decision? Does it make sense? Does it, yeah. you know, is it part of your project plan? You know, in the Enneagram, we talk about there being three centers, the body, the heart and the head and how, you know, you had a body first, like mm -hmm. in the beginning, you had a body. And then if you've been around small kids, they are these bodies with all these emotions just flailing about. The head doesn't fully function as Come far as your whole prefrontal cortex functioning fully until your mid-20s. But the head comes on and we rely on it for everything. And we think information will matter. But information yeah. is not transformation. Information yeah. is not curative. Just yeah. because you know doesn't mean you actually change. I mean, <laughs> there's tons of people that know everything and are doing nothing about it. They so can't. much right. matters. Right? Yeah, and, and if you're a type like me, like a like a seven, where you, I'm like, just give me more information. I know that will fix it. <laughs> I mean, you said to me once, like, no, you actually have to feel your feelings, not just think them. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> it was like this mind blown moment. So the so, goal so, of my life is to get people to say to me, "Fuck you." Uh, in a good well, way. Yeah. <laughs> You've, you've gotten me to do that many times. L luckily, it's, it's what I love. Yeah, the way good truth feels, and I've had this happen to me so often, is there's a confrontational aspect to it, there's a challenge aspect to it, but it can only come through in that way because you know that person is like in your corner or like wants your best. And yeah, that, I think the energy can only kind of come through in that regard. Yeah. And so it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful moment. I say that you know, dishonesty or I suppose you could say untruth feels uncomfortable but confining and when we hear the truth it also feels uncomfortable but expansive. expansive. Yeah. Right. You know oh, you know so the difference when you feel it. Both things are uncomfortable, but one is one's expansive. So back to the journey. So you took a trip to Boston. Your body was like, yes. Yeah. And, you know, when we started, when we started working together and Joel was really on the edge of burnout and that's his kind of story to tell. But we stumbled into the Enneagram and he did it because he was in burnout and I did it because I thought it would help me understand other people better. Mm -hmm. And then I was confronted with myself, which I think happens to a lot of people. We will go in to something often not even for the right reasons. Like I think that's happened to me a lot. I've gone into something for the wrong reasons and then I am confronted in the process and that confrontation yeah. is a beautiful one. And we recorded a series of live panels, which we call Enneagram panels. So of the nine personality types in the Enneagram, Enneagram just means Ennea, nine in Greek, gram, type, or figure. So there's nine types in the Enneagram, and we did panels. We recorded them because Joel needed to do that for his certification process. And I said, hey, let's throw these on the internet and see if anyone listens to them. And, and, and by panel, you mean you had because so, I was yeah. on this, you had several people of a certain Enneagram type sit together and yeah. talk about what talk it's about, like to be yeah. them. Yeah, what is it like to be you? Because a lot of times Enneagram teachers will describe someone or what it's like to be that, but they can never really do it because it's not, they're not embodying that. And I think we come from yeah. the narrative tradition, which is very much like, how do you embody? How do you express your type? This is not put you in a box. This is the you are here spot on the map. And then you are your unique expression of your type. And so we wanted to do that. And we thought this might be helpful for someone. And then all of a sudden we check one day and it's like in the top 10 of any Enneagram podcasts. And we're going, well, we should do another season maybe. And so we did that. And then we're like, now we're starting to get contacted from around the world. Like maybe we should turn this into a business. So it went from being the Enneagram panels podcast and we sat down with Laura McCowan and she, she like gave us some plans and things that we should work on in the business and at Starbucks, renamed it. I so remember that. At yeah. Starbucks. Yeah. We came up with all these names and then you said the art of growth. And it was mm -hmm. like, that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. because that's what we are. 
the Enneagram is a big part of it. But even what we're talking about today is adjacent, but it's really about people taking their next step. And I think this is what I call the wisdom industry. If you want to be in the wisdom industry, you're trying to help people take their next step. As I take my own, you know, now I definitely do not see myself as above or beyond anyone. Like I have to be, I have to be in this with you or it has no authority. Yeah. Oh, you just reminded me of something I meant to bring up to you uh, that I heard on Rob Bell, one of Rob Bell's recent podcasts, one of my favorite episodes he's ever done, is everyone is looking for you. And Mm. He, he talks about that Jesus's ability to have compassion for the people around him was in direct was in direct relationship or direct proportion to his ability to understand to know what he needs he himself needs and that required him to have boundaries. The central part of the story in that podcast was Jesus was at in a certain town, you know, had provided a sermon the night before. Tons of people were, you know, there and it was a big success and and people were knocking on the door all throughout the night in the morning saying we need you again. We we have questions. We want this. They were going to his his um I don't know what the the right his name disciples. is, but his yeah. But they were going to his like he has a he has a team <laughs> around yeah. him. Yeah, the, the team disi- of disciples. Yeah. Okay, so, so he has. A t- he was like thirty years old, and then when a rabbi is like thirty years old, they'll have a bunch of people who are like late teens, early twenties, yeah. who kind of are learning from them, and they also kind of um, manage the time of of the teacher. Yes, and so after yeah, yeah. this is actually in Mark one. And Jesus is, uh, you know, oh, he's just done all this incredible healing and speaking and all this stuff. And then it, the morning comes and yeah. everyone's looking for you. Yes. The next morning, everyone's looking yeah. for him and his disciples are freaking out like, hello, we need to give them more. We have to give yeah. them more. Right. And so Mark comes Crowds to him are ready and to go. Let's do it. Car- Mark comes success. to him and, s- and says, uh, hey, everyone is looking for you. And all Jesus says is, like, oh, yeah, let's go to the next town. We're, come on, let's go. Doesn't even respond to him, doesn't even, right. you know, acknowledge that other people, you know, everyone's looking for him. I think what a lot of people, when they talk about this Christ figure, is so many people, when they talk about the divine, it's an external entity or power or energy. It yes. is something other than it is the interventionist God that's out there somewhere that I want to come and fix this thing over here. And what the Christ embodies is the incarnate, which is the God within. What if the divine is embodied in all of us and we all have an obligation of what to do with that energy within us? It pulls away from dogma, but it definitely pulls us towards a responsiveness instead of a reactiveness. And that's what Jesus is doing in that story. He's going, no, (laughs) no, there's a lot of agendas and there will always be a lot of agendas. Mm -hmm. And we have to be clearer and clearer on our no, so that we can live our fullest. Yes. But it's not coming from a place of I'm better than you. I'm detached from this. And, and to bring it back around to the work in the Enneagram, what you found, I, th- I think, because I was there for this part of your journey, yeah. what started to light you up was being in a room with these different types and experiencing mm. their energy and their what it's like to be them firsthand. Yeah. Well, what's it's so funny because I think we all sort of inherently believe that we are normal and everyone else is some aberration of normal. Like this is what normal looks like. And then there's these other versions that are not quite normal or we project our thing onto them. Right. So we go in one of those two directions and sitting in these rooms with like a room full of people that are not like me and going, wow, they are 
holy other, and I mean that in all of the different ways you can mean the word holy, holy and completely and holy as in wow, holy other. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I think I fell in love with people in a way that I never had before. And I wasn't as angry or frustrated by where other people were at because of my type and my Enneagram, my own story. My energy came from being angry or caffeinated. Mm -hmm. And when I ran out of anger, I was really exhausted. And then I had to find a different energy to walk with. So that evolved into what is now the art of growth. What is it? What is the work? Yeah. That's the, that's the continually evolving question. And I have to ask myself that question all the time, which is, what do I want to see more of in the world? I want people to be fully seen, like all of it. All of it has to be seen. Mm -hmm. Welcomed as such, mm -hmm. with no shame or fear or anger or any of that, just welcomed and empowered to go towards the direction I often refer to like that redeemed version of yourself that's calling out to you to move towards it. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that with my life, that is a day well spent. And often it happens in the in the minuscule and the mundane, but that's all part of it. Yeah. The dirty that's... enlightenment, as you know, I call it. Dirty enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you are doing that. I mean, you do do that. No, both you know, in your work, I've seen you do the actual work, which we're going to get into next, but it personally, I mean, that's who you are. That's who you've been yeah. to me for sure. You, mm. you have been one of the very few people that in my life that calls the, the absolute best version of me forward and doesn't mm. at all shame me for being wherever I am that loves that too. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I don't, like shame anymore like being raised in the church it's something that i was all too familiar with but i now am very familiar with the fact that shame it just gives that illusion of moral advancement without any of its benefits Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the executive producer of the podcast. At TMST, we're passionate about having conversations that bring us together and help us stoke our love of life. That's why we created a dedicated site for the show. It's free. It's not a Facebook group. And we aren't mining your data to target you with ads. So check it out. And while you're there, please join TMST Plus, our paid membership group. TMST Plus members will play the critical role and keeping this going and ad free. There are no corporations backing us. There's no advertisers. I mean, it's really up to us to pull together and make it happen. You can make a one-time contribution or you can join our monthly program where you can help shape the show, hear the complete unedited interviews and join regular online experiences with Laura. But know this, you can make a huge difference right now for as little as $10 a month. You can find the link in the show description, and then please head over to tmstpod.com right now and join us. So now I'm going to bring us up to the point where you introduced this concept that we're going to focus on, which was in late, no, early July. I had a mm -hmm. retreat for my company, for the Luckiest Club, where 18 of us on the team, the majority of the team got together and at this retreat center for a weekend. You came and spent 
time with us and you did a bit of a talk about and one of one of the things that you talked about the whole team was talking about for the rest of the retreat and mm. I actually hadn't heard you talk about it before and it was this concept of with energy and I've been thinking about it so what is it where do you where'd you come up with it what is it yeah so I started the talk by saying with is the energy of breakthrough. And I saw people kind of like looking at me and a couple of you were writing it down but being like, okay, where is this going? Why what am I writing this down? Right yeah. Why am I writing this down? With energy. So I'll back up, I'll give a little bit of the structure and I'll try and make it as, as simple and clear as possible. And just to make a note, we have all the types within us. So we all use different aspects of all of these energies at different times. Yeah. But the, one of the premier ways that those types move through the world with their energy is kind of at, whether it's at through charm, at through <laughs> convincing, I have to convince you, right, of my great idea, or of just force and decision. Even when it's for you, like even when they're trying to help, it can feel critical, it can feel aggressive, it can feel intense to a lot of us. Because at tends to divide the world. And we've seen a lot of at or against energy in the world right now. We were talking a little bit about this because mm -hmm. at divides the world into for and against, in, out, right, wrong. And so even when it's trying to help, even when it's trying to, it's trying to get you to join the right side or join the right perspective, there's a fear that's motivating this. There's an, there's an which creates this anger so that I can feel safer, it becomes force. And so, even at the best intentions, even when people are trying to help, if they are applying at energy, if, and we've all seen this, like, right? So we've heard someone speaking and we've just felt this, it just feels like you're coming at me right now, yeah. right? Yeah, there's a need, like I need you to be here. I need you to, or be there. I need you to be on this side. I need you to get it, right? And that's exactly well put because it's I, it's my need, right? So I'm trying to meet my need. I need you because I am uncomfortable with where you are. I need yep. you to be where I am. And um, I know that in in your work, uh, you had a couple experiences where you really experienced this energy um, and that it was, it was hurtful because people who you thought were, oh, these are people who are with me, right? But really, yeah. it's conditional. And that's, I think, a big thing about at or against energy. It's very conditional, yeah. right? Yeah, yep. So, so at or against energy are, mm -hmm. we're gonna call them the same thing. At, coming at, mm -hmm. coming against energy are, yes. are the same, okay? And we've seen it, and a lot of times people use certain public figures as a proxy for their at energy. Like, well, that person just tells it like it is, right? Well, that person, well, they're you know they don't hold anything back. You know, they're yeah. they're really speaking there, and they're what they're really saying is, I wish I could say it like that. I wish I could be. Sometimes they're That's very intelligent think. or articulate, but there's a real force forcefulness to them, right? And so and and. And we a like that energy in a way. Yeah. We yeah. do. It, yeah, it we... feels very solid and secure. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm, I feel insecure and this person sounds so certain. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's a political figure or a pastor or a preacher, a religious leader. There's a dogmatism to it. And even if they're presenting it with charm, there is a clarity and people long for clarity. Yes, I was and gonna so, say that. We crave certainty. We we absolutely yes. crave certainty. And if we can't hold paradox for a num any number of reasons, I mean children are the best example. They live in this space of of either or black or white. In order to make sense of the world, they have to split it. This is yeah. good, this is bad. And and it's a natural part of uh, maturation in a way but a lot of people yeah. stop there and because it's really hard to hold paradox it's really hard to hold nuance it's really hard mm. to acknowledge complexity and to allow it to exist it's confronting right 
And if you think about one of the ways that we, the primary ways we express ourselves and receive information now is online and through social media, it asks a lot of, of the, both the recipient and the person communicating, whatever it is, to convey nuance. It doesn't work in a meme, right? We, right, I was just we gonna are bring up memes, yeah. Yeah, we, we want the, the world to be digestible in meme format. And there was a study that I just read where the content that gets the most traction on social media is always confrontational. It's always- oh, for sure divisive it's picking one stance it's it's actually what they've referred to it as, as against when you are against something else that gets the mm. most traction it's a fascinating human study and it, it's yeah. also a little terrifying because staying stuck there is it's limited there's a mm. there's a big old ceiling on that it's the power of noise even though <sighs> whispers get sustained through time Mm. But but shouts, they get attention of the moment. You you, and, you reminded me of this in a beautiful way with, with my work. Yeah. Um, yes, because I was saying that you're doing something like wisdom. It, it tends to have a, a lower frequency level. It's base. It just mm -hmm. widens and it, it expands over time. And there was some frustration, as many of us have, with someone who's getting a lot of attention because there are a lot of noise and it's loud if it's loud if it's certain and if it's against you can guarantee it'll get attention at least mm -hmm. for a minute mm -hmm. it's a three minute pop song of a one hit wonder yeah that's how i see it yeah someone actually once said in order to start a religion you don't need a god but you do need a devil you need something to be against and so when we're talking about at or against energy and and like I said, it's not always with ill intent. We're kind of looking at the negative side of it. But like a lot of times it does have a good intent. It wants to, it's trying to present a certain because it's trying to give people something that they're craving. Yeah. And if someone like feels that level of certainty, then it feels secure to others. And I get it. I, get I it. totally get it. I mean, I've been in that place before. It's the most acute or sort of bright example in the in recent history is how I had to be with sobriety. When you first yeah. start, it's like you have to push so hard to have the boundary out and have it well defined. And this is good for me. This is bad for me. I mean, that's why people get judgmental when they make a massive life change, because you, <laughs> you almost have to, right? It's yeah. like, you have to have that firm boundary, that really defined, like you're, you're creating a new identity and that, that identity needs space and time and a container in which to grow. And yeah. so you have to have this clear division. And then over time, you can allow paradox and nuance to come in. So I, I don't want people to think that we're shaming that as a whole. What, the commentary is more on just staying stuck there and how enticing it is to stay stuck there and how limiting it is, how, how yeah. ultimately the wisdom isn't there, right? The wisdom yeah. isn't there. Yeah. What I call personality is too much of a good thing. Mm. So personality <laughs> is, is your natural tools, your natural tendency, your natural gift overused. And mm. so like at energy against energy is my home base. And I know that, but when it was the only one, it's super limiting. Like I still sometimes struggle with the nostalgia of my former certainty. Mm. But it just doesn't work anymore. It needed to expand. Yeah. So let's talk about the next energy. So that's at Please. energy. The next energy is uh, toward. And what toward energy feels like is... <sighs> what I call over ownership. So I see something and then I feel responsibility and ownership of I need to solve it. I need to fix it. And a lot of times in relationships, this is like taking too much responsibility for the solution. This is uh, what a lot of couples therapists are calling one person's doing too much of the emotional labor. Mm -hmm. So they are doing all of the work. So, you know, the, 
two people, we're on two separate islands, and we have this bridge in between, but but instead of meeting in the middle, one person is constantly crossing the entire bridge, trying to take so much responsibility for the connection. And yeah. this is the this is the parent, right? The parent's like, I'm just trying to help, and the kid's like, Let me do it because some, the kid needs to do it themselves. Right. This energy means well, but it takes on too much responsibility, and it needs to learn the not mine of life. <laughs> and I get it. You're you're wanting to help. You're wanting connection. You're wanting relationship and security and support and you want to be heard and loved and you want to make a difference in the world but this is an energy that it overuses moving toward okay yeah okay so right we won't go off as much on that rabbit hole but a, because neither one of us are on that one. No, I don't have anything to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just sort of like grabbed your hair like, I don't know. Like, but no, like this is, but for some that really, that will resonate that, you know, over ownership yeah. relationally. Like I, we, we all get it, but that's very different than, you know, this last energy, which is the withdrawing energy or what we call away. It pulls back. So it disappears from the engagement. It's trying to like preserve individuality. So I have to withdraw to preserve my individuality or my resources, right? My energetic yeah. resources. It's avoidant because it doesn't want certain kinds of disruption or to be overwhelmed. Now, yep. some people think that they're being aloof or that they are detached. And sometimes when people like this, they start talking about meditations of detachment. I was like, no, no, that's the last thing you need. Yeah. Like some of these others, like the toward people might need a little bit of detachment uh, meditation. Yeah, but yeah. You, you, you got that down. But away energy, it sometimes pulls back when it should stay present, right? Yep. So would you say that, you know, ideally, as we grow, we are stewards of all three of these energies? Well, when you see the options on the table, like you said, it's not limiting, it's expansive. All of a mm -hmm. sudden, you can actually say, what is the energy that I'm overusing? So you want mm -hmm. to tune into that. And then how do I actually come back to a more full, a more holistic approach um, to life with the integration of these different energies? Right, right. Right. <clears throat> okay, so what's the difference between the at and the toward at is a lot more aggressive and it's got a finished product in mind at is looking for a result toward is looking for a connection mm. so there's an underlying yes. need that's different there got it what it, that what makes so much there. sense my fellow folks in recovery probably i just imagine my them wincing like oh yeah i do that so much this is where the enneagram classically ends is like these are the three energies mm -hmm. and i just didn't feel solutioned or satisfied with that mm -hmm. and it came out in a conversation with a person about how they were communicating and i was like when that you were communicating on that it really felt at like at the people like you were trying to get them somewhere and it needed more with. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, what's going, okay. Hold on. Pay attention, hold on. I'm on, there's something happening here. I'm, I'm paying attention to something. And Joel and I have had so many discussions about this and he's like, this is really, with energy is really the counter to all of these energies. Like with is totally different. Mm -hmm. With, it doesn't hold up its own agenda you know, it doesn't overstep its supportiveness. It's boundaried, but it's present. That to me is what so much is great about with energy. When someone is with you, you feel like, yes, they understand that we are two different people. We respect that. But I'm still present to who you are. I'm not trying to fix you. I'm not saying there's something wrong with you that I need to fix. I need to change you because of my anxiety. And if you've had a moment where you feel like, oh, this person is with me, you feel incredibly safe. You feel yeah. incredibly supported. 
you feel like you can move forward, but it doesn't feel like force and it doesn't feel like over ownership. It feels like, oh yeah, we're together in this. There's two things that it reminds me of is one that there's a beautiful part of in Khalil Gibran's book, The Prophet, I think it's a meditation on or the, the piece on marriage where he shows the image of two people standing side by side, not facing each other, but standing by side by side in their own space, honoring the sovereignty of the other but facing in the same direction. Yes, that is the epitome of with energy because toward or at can be face to face and the withdrawing or away is like that back or back to back. But with is a side by side energy. Mm-hmm. And you, you brought up marriage. So I think to embody this a little bit, I'll, I'll share this story. I, I wish the story that came to mind was one that made me look better. This one is like an example of where I was an asshole, but I think it's, it's more, it's authentic. So when my daughter was in kindergarten, she suddenly decided that she hated all clothing and every single morning of our lives was a nightmare and a travesty of everyone's emotions getting shredded the first half hour of the day trying to get her ready and out the door. Like of all the things I imagined in parenting, I worried about so many different things. I never thought that the most contentious (laughs) things in our life would be around clothes. It shut down the house. Mm -hmm. And I applied so much at energy. So my wife is very chill, very peaceful. You use the phrase for her strong a strong force and that is really that that's soft really accurate force. soft a force. soft force yes a soft force yeah she is a soft force and that is very accurate but she's very kind of she's very sweet she doesn't like have real highs and lows she's pretty chill my daughter is very intense so she's a little bit more like me and i remember this one day i don't even know what happened i don't remember at the time i just know it was awful And I felt levels of anger that I have not felt since I was a teenager. And I'm taking Vera to school. I'm walking to her to school. And usually, even if it had been bad in the morning, we would sort of work it out. And we'd like apologize and talk and we'll try this better tomorrow. And we would have that conversation and we try to repair on the way to school. That day, there was none of that. Like I was frozen ice. I was made of brick and stone in that moment. It was force versus force, but I'm bigger and stronger and scarier as dad. Mm -hmm. And I was just wanted the result. Like we have to get to school on time. And it felt so awful walking her to school, but I wasn't feeling anything at that moment except for the anger. And so I walked her there. She went in and I just started walking. I didn't go home. I just started walking the neighborhood. And then, then not only the anger was present, but then the shame comes up of like, why can't I handle this better? Like, what could I do? I felt trying to come up with different solutions, but feeling so disempowered in my head. And so I'm feeling all of this anger, like all this fear that what's going to happen to my kid if she can't even handle getting dressed, like, and I'm projecting that way out in the future, of course. And then all this shame around how I'm responding and it's just mounting kind of inside of me. And my wife texted me and she could have said a lot of things. She could have withdrawn and she could have confronted me and she would have been absolutely right. It wouldn't have been helpful but it would have been right. But she also didn't just try to move toward me like, oh, everything's fine and and I'll like, we'll fix this. And like, didn't know platitudes on that. I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was, I know that was really hard for you. I know that was really hard on all of us and I'm with you and we'll figure this out. Mm -hmm. And the stone and the ice, (laughs) 
melted away and I just started like crying walking down the street and going that with energy it saved our family that day Mm -hmm. we could have been contentious all day with each other it changed the atmosphere in the home because there was no longer this at versus withdrawn versus toward like none of that was going on it was with Mm -hmm. and because she was able to bridge that she broke me with her love Mm -hmm. because that with energy it isn't ultimately concerned with who's right and who's wrong but how to move or return it's about the return to health about re-engaging that connection and that is the energy I really want to carry so much more because when you see the beauty of it, and that's the thing about with energy, you just feel like this is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I think this is what I want for people is like if if we're actually going to have a more grace-filled world, we have to notice these patterns of am I being at, am I being toward, am I withdrawing? And we have to be with. We have to be with each other. Yeah. You've told me that story before, but I've never heard it slowed down like that and I I get it in in my body I feel it it's it's grace there's Mm -hmm. so much grace in that in that energy there's so many things held simultaneously at once with the simple statement of I'm with you yeah it holds the grace and the truth together like it Mm -hmm. wasn't like Let's ignore the truth and pretend something didn't happen. Yes. And it's not like everything is okay, but it held no. grace and truth together. Yeah, you can still, there's accountability there. There's, you have your part, I have mine. There's no shame. I think that's one of the big pieces of it. You can see as you were talking just how, how things fall apart so extraordinarily in personal relationships, marriages, friendships, families, communities, our culture at large, because we can't seem to embody this with, we just can't, we can't. We only know what we are for in so far as we know what we're against. Mm. It ends there. It takes extraordinary awareness of your own wholeness, meaning your limitations that you that you embody all of it that not, that whatever that other person doing isn't separate from you all right. or something that's not within you right what you said that broke me is she broke me with love in that moment yeah you know i think love it gets this sugar cody everything's fine let go <sighs> yeah excuse all whatever behavior that's not what that is that had yeah. there was weight in that and nobody resists that with energy it breaks down resistance you know we resist the at energy we resist someone moving toward us like ah this is my life we move we resist when someone is moving away from us because like where are you going that away energy but with energy it we don't resist that it it breaks it, through it's yeah. so loving. It's so loving because it is boundaried and present. Yeah, and we, we we might mistrust it. I know I have. Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you're talking to someone you don't, who you expect to be against you, yeah. which is my experience that you meant, that you had alluded to. But with is willing to <sighs> earn trust. With yeah. is willing to earn the trust. Right. And with the the thing I think that's so powerful about it is it acknowledges each other's humanity. We have such low expectations of others. We have such little belief in other people. I don't know if it's a it's a lack of belief in basic goodness. What comes to me is that when you come towards someone to fix them with a certain result in mind, which is a lot of what we see online. Yeah, very agenda-driven, yes. Yeah. Or if you 
come towards someone because you want to take over, you want to do the work for them, the presupposition underneath that is you can't handle it. You're not capable. You're not enough. You're not enough. Or you're too much. The two messages that we constantly have to deal with. We all grew up hearing, right? You're either not enough or you're too much. So if you're mm -hmm. too much, I need to stop it, hold it back, or move away from you. Yeah, pull away mm -hmm. from you. That's if you're too much. And if you're not enough, then I have to, like, make you more or I just take over, right? Yeah. And so these right. are all the different ways that we're trying to create a solution. But it's, it's a, a solution that is dehumanizing to others. It doesn't elevate the uniqueness of another. We don't see a lot of this with energy and leadership. No. Leadership tends towards either toward, I take over and do it for you, or at, this is what, this is what I'm going to do for you, uh, and this is how I'm going to do it. This is why, um, with the diminishing of spiritual communities, politics has become the new religion, because mm. it has, it tries to be all that certainty of the at and the security of the toward but it removes responsibility from um, all of us. And I really believe we never have any kind of a fulfillment in our lives unless we take radical responsibility, unless mm -hmm. we en engage with ourselves and we call others to radical responsibility. And that is part of with. With can call others towards radical responsibility because it's right. not telling well, them what to do and it's not taking over. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the teachers that are the leaders that I can think of that are that embody that. And I'll be I'll be thinking about that for a while. But aside from that, what the the heartening message in this is at the individual level, it just it exponentially ripples out mm -hmm. when we encounter it, when we offer it. Yes when we do the work that we need to do internally so that we can offer it, because there's a certain level of awareness and growth and growth, I would say, and wisdom that one must not just learn about but experience within themselves in order to be able to offer it. Yeah, completely. And this is why I think so many of us are pulling our energies more and more towards this and wanting to be like this. It's like, this is literally my job all day is to be yeah. with people. Like, yeah. so this is when I get off of this call, I'm, I'm going to be on a call with someone I've never met. I've never had a conversation with, and my whole job will be wit to be with them for 90 minutes to let them be fully seen, um, to be welcomed as such and empowered towards the direction they want to go. That is now the question that is driving at the heart of, uh, what I want my interactions to be like. Can every interaction I have, can I be with the person mm -hmm. I'm with? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I be with the person I'm with? If I was to sum it up in a bow, like ask yourself that question when you're going to meet with someone. Can I be with the person I'm with? If I do that, you have done everything that is required of you for the day. Yeah. When you say that, because I learned so much from you, you know, just to sort of call myself out here, I would say my job is also to be with, with people, part of it. But I watch you be with in that with energy and I learned from that because I, I'm very seduced by self-righteousness. I'm very seduced by toward energy and, and especially at, like very seduced by that. It's, that is, I would say that, you know, the, the primary energy that has animated me throughout my life is I've got it. I'm going to do it. You, you know, this is how it's done. I'm going to give you the answer. Right. <laughs> but your writing doesn't feel that way. I think people are attracted to your writing because it feels with like we are the luckiest. It feels like I am right there with you. You're taking me into your story, but you're allowing me to participate in it. Like, I think that's what great writers do. I think great writers, they do. They, right. I like, I'm not observing you. I'm, I'm with you. No, totally. I, I, yeah, no, I agree. And thank you for reflecting that back to me. Like I, I, m the writing does feel like when I, when I, my writing does feel like with energy. And, and when I'm talking about something 
like you know getting sober where that it was is so humbling i know that experience so deeply in my body that i can speak about it not from a place of intellectual know-how but like from embodied experience right so mm -hmm. I, I it should i hope it feels like with but what i'm talking about is just you know and this is normal i just want to call it it is like the reason I'm even bringing this up is when you said, can I be with the one I'm with? My first thought is, that sounds like an exhausting way to live. <laughs> 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 but I, but I, I know that's a certain part of me speaking up because that's actually the toward energy mm. voice, right? Because I think, oh, if I'm with that person, I have to feel everything they're feeling. I have to take it right. on. I have to to provide solutions. I have to, and, and that's not what it is, right? That right. is not what it is. It's one of the, the most amazing things about Todd is he is, he's really good at being with, like mm. listening, but not trying to fix or take on. And sometimes it's frustrating to me, you know, it's like, wait, no, get mad with me. Like, <laughs> do this with me, like join in the, whatever it is I'm, you right. know, spinning out about and, and offer a solution or show, you know, and so it's, it's a, it's a, con he's like, I'm cool, man. He's like, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm good. But he's not, it's not that he's not present. Right. It's, he's totally present to it and he'll bring but it he's up. He's not owning it. He's not owning it. He's not right. owning it. And so, so I, as you were saying that I had my own sort of full circle process of going, oh my God, that mm. sounds exhausting, da, 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 da. But, but it's something I've had to learn is to not own it. And, and yeah. what it actually means to be with is not that. I think we mistake that a lot. Mm. Yeah, and I think the days that I'm most exhausted is when I started feeling my energy get pulled in all the other directions. I like know. when I was actually with someone, I like it was fine. Um, because then I left and I was, you know, I was me. I was in my own space. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't still holding on because I didn't have some agenda from the adder toward energy, like carrying on. We can rest. We can rest in that space. I think that's the whole thing is I, I want the idea of with energy to be freeing. I want for people to understand that they don't have to get pulled and yanked around. They have other options. Like, so it's not narrowing. It's, it's freeing. It's not like, oh, you were these other entries. Now you have to be this. It's like, let these energies dance. Let them be in a, in a play together and be like, you know, I could, I could apply a little more of this. This is another option on the table for me now. Mm -hmm. I, I want it to be expansive, not limiting. And I yeah. think that's the whole thing is the right truth. It is. It's expansive. It's not limiting. Yeah. The reason we talked about this for 90 minutes or at least an hour is because you, it, it, takes that to really define you can define what something is but but you also have to define what it's not mm. uh, and and there's so much there's it's a simple concept mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it's easy right it's it's a simple concept but it's not easy and and it can be so much goes into being able to be with in yeah. with energy, you know, all your attachment shit comes into play and all your trauma <laughs> yeah, right. and all of your, right. you know, all of that. Well, all transformative concepts are simple to understand and difficult to do. <laughs> yeah. We often look for the complicated. We think it, you know, it like, has to be more like how do I get, that. how do I get sober, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, you stop drinking first. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's simple to understand. It's difficult to do. All transformation will work that way, is that yeah. way, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and you practice and you practice and you practice, just like we were talking about the other day. You get you get a new set of information or you get something that's that kind of won't leave you alone, a lesson or, or, or something, and, and then you are set off to practice it. And mm. sometimes for a long time. I think I think anything worth doing is worth doing badly. And so I'll practice this the rest of my life. It's yeah. worth it's worth my time. It is absolutely worth your time. Where do we find you? Yes. So where do people find me? So the hub of all our work is theartofgrowth.org. You know, check out the Art of Growth podcast if you want to find out more about the Enneagram or, or our work. And I am just honored to um to be on this journey. I'm honored to be on this journey with you. I love Me too. 
I love getting to be a part of this. It's just so, I feel so lucky. I, you could say the luckiest, one might say. You, one might say, <laughs> we are. Oh God, did I really do that? You did. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, where, that's where we'll end it. <laughs> sorry, sorry, not sorry. Fair sorry, enough. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Thank you for hanging out with us today. We want every episode of Tell Me Something True to give you something you can use in your life. We also don't want there to be any barriers between us. That's why we built our own online community. It's free, it's not Facebook. And you can head on over to tmstpod.com to connect with folks around this episode. Also, have you noticed there aren't any ads on TMST? That's by design. We want to keep the show and our digital spaces ad-free, but that's a goal we can only accomplish if we work together. And that's where you can make a huge difference. TMST is being built as an ad-free, subscriber-driven project. The subscribing members will play the critical role in keeping this going and keeping it ad-free. There are no corporations backing us, no sponsors, so it's really up to us. And the good news is, folks are signing up. Thank you so much to all of you who have come on board for this very unusual way to do things. You can join them when you make a one-time contribution or join our monthly program. We have cool opportunities for you to help shape the show, hear the complete unedited interviews, ask our guests questions before they're on, and connect with other TMST folks. I cannot stress this enough. You can make a huge difference for as little as $10 a month. So head on over to tmstpod.com right now. Tell Me Something True is engineered and mixed by Paul Chufo. Michael Elsesser and I dreamed up this show and we're looking forward to joining you online and next time at Tell Me Something True.